Um, so welcome everybody to PCC Forum, uh, the student run group that is uh, bringing in a whole lot of um, cutting edge conversations uh, that um, are really a privilege to uh, hear and, and be a part of. So I want to introduce uh, tonight uh, Soleil Chapelle. Uh, Soleil is a PCC master's student from the class of 2016. Uh, they've returned to their practice of philosophy through teaching contemporary dance and, chore and choreographing uh, for Bellingham Repertory Dance in Washington State. Uh, Swells and Tides are foundational to their creative and philosophical work. Their dance classes are spaces to continually return to the body, learn to fall, float, and make friends with the floor. Uh, they teach phenomenology to their dancers as a part of creative process. And additionally, they practice craniosacral therapy, which explores the fluidity of fascia and the tides of cerebral spinal fluid. Soleil is looking forward to sharing insight from dance and body research with the philosophy, cosmology, and consciousness community. Um, and so uh, tonight we're going to be listening to the phenomenology of tides meeting mid-pandemic disorientation with phenomenology, dance, and body awareness. So thank you all for being here. Thank you, Soleil, especially for uh, being here with us tonight. And I look forward to um, what's about to come next. So take it away, please. Awesome. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, I, it's hearing my own introduction is it realizing what a mouthful the, all the things that I'm bringing together here is, but these are my three main passions are dance, philosophy, and body work, and, um, and really this metaphor of tides and water in general is something that permeates everything that I do. Um, so thank you so much for having me. Um, I would like to welcome everyone. Um, there's people from a few different communities joining us tonight. And so I would I'm, thank you for attending. And um, I would like to shout out that even my 96-year-old uh, grandmother is with us over Zoom, using Zoom uh, without anyone else helping her. She got on here by herself. <laughs> Hi, Grandma. <laughs> um, yeah. And I would like to... Um, so we have, so we've got people from philosophy, people from dance in here. So I'm not gonna assume that everyone knows everything. So I'll keep on uh, defining things as I go along. Um, yeah. I wanna begin with a dedication to our late and wonderful Stephen Goodman. Um, there is resonance of his embodied presence in this work. He was an enthusiastic advocate for thinking with movement and dance, and I felt his wisdom throughout the process of preparing for this talk. The metaphor of tides for this stage of the pandemic is something that came to me viscerally. There was a simplicity to the early stages of the pandemic lockdown. I felt a clear distinction of what I was allowed to do and was not allowed to do. And I was lucky enough to have support and spaciousness in my work and dance company to tend to stress and difficult emotions. Then gradually life sped up again as my communities and I adapted with vaccinations and protocols. Now I'm busier than I was before the pandemic greatly because when I was pulled away from what I love to do, it gave me the drive to dedicate myself fully to community-oriented dance, philosophy, and body work. But there is still a pandemic, still an added layer of decision-making and stress in everything we do, no matter how used to it we become. The result is I feel pulled by strong forces in multiple directions at once. It reminds me of a rip current when waves are coming into the shore and a strong flow is simultaneously pulling out to sea. When people are caught in rip currents, it can be disorienting and panic inducing. When you try to get out of it, 
it's most dangerous if you swim against the current and try to go back to shore. But if you let go and allow it to take you further out to sea, it will eventually dissipate and release you. But then you're out in open waters and eventually you will need something to keep you afloat. So if you're still with me on this metaphor, dance is what's kept me afloat throughout the pandemic. And I've reason to believe that there are elements of somatic contemporary dance that can be accessible to everyone to provide buoyancy out at sea. No matter how used to this we become, we are still surrounded by changing tides. It's not some distant shore. Our lives are rising and falling in response to global events. Throughout this talk, I will be going back and forth between speaking metaphorically and literally. At the risk of confusion, I would like to accept the murkiness between scientific fact and the symbols and imagery we use to describe our experiences. This space in between that could also be called liminal space or interstitial space is where phenomenology is practiced and it's where our lived experience, where our lived experiences resonate. So to reiterate the metaphor of tides that I'm using to speak to the pulling away and returning that has cycled through this pandemic, um, the gravitational forces of the collective response to COVID-19 pulled us away from physical contact. For some, this caused a return to an awareness of the people and things that we value the most when we were pulled away from everything that was familiar and taken for granted. And then as vaccinations became widely available, many of us felt the pull to return to all our, our familiar activities. And um, some of us may have overcommitted with the Russia possibility. And then very quickly, Delta became very present in our communities again, and we had to pull back as the tides pulled us back. And um, simultaneously, the demands of continuing our lives in capitalism and just keeping things going that could still be pulling you in in an opposite direction. And then of course, on top of that, there's social movements, political movements, environmental destruction happening, and that pulls us into our responses and griefs and actions. And then of course, there's our emotions and the psychological impact of all of this on ourselves. And then of course, our communities and everyone else around us. So it's a lot to track outside of ourselves, let alone how our bodies are doing inside of it. I'm gonna read a quote to describe what literal tides are from a book aptly titled Understanding Tides by Stacey Dopp Hicks. Quote, Tides should be thought of as being in the form of waves. These waves are thousands of miles in length. Their crests are the high tides, their troughs, the low tides, and the horizontal component of the water par particles that make up the wave are the tidal currents. To complicate the matter, these waves combine to reinforce or interfere with each other in varying amounts partially contributing to the wide differences in tidal characteristics as actually observed. The tide is fundamentally caused by gravitational interactions between the sun, moon, and earth. These interactions of gravitational forces are the same as those causing the moon and earth to remain in their respective orbits, end quote. I'd like to note that tides are also more extreme during eclipses, and there is a lunar eclipse happening tomorrow, kind of in the, close to now-ish, <laughs> between now and tomorrow. And also, um, on a more somber note, um, this week there's been devastating flooding in um, the Bellingham area where I live, as well as the surrounding areas. The rising water brought the visceral quality of tides to the surface, where I live in town was luckily not flooded, but many people, including farm workers in the rural areas have been displaced. 
the Lummi tribe has been cut off from the mainland by the flooding of the Nooksack River and are having to use boats to receive essential services. So I wanna state that um, I'm in a very privileged position to be able to reflect on the archetypal significance of these events as my life was not upended by them. Tides are something to be paid attention to. They disrupt and change landscapes. They promise our landscapes will always be changing. So we can think about tides as a metaphor, or we can think about tides as a large scale expression of what is also happening inside of our bodies. This is a quote from the book Job's Body by Dean Juin. Job's Body is an incredible um, tome of a, for body workers has lots of incredible stuff. Um, quote, what is a human being? A human being is a container invented by water so that it can walk around. The fluid bathing our own cells throughout every nook and cranny of our bodies can still be resolved into the basic proportions of elements, salts, and carbon compounds, the organic building blocks that are found in the ocean. So we did not really leave the sea behind at all we were and are obliged to carry part of it with us. We are in fact, mostly water. As terrestrial organisms, we live on solid ground and breathe air, but as a collection of individual cells, we still live within the same liquid medium from which we first emerged. Every organ and system in the body supports in some way, the containment, the renewal, and the circulation of this internal sea end quote. So we experience the world through our watery bodies. We may not experience our bodies as fluid. Some of us may not experience our bodies much at all, but we are nevertheless bodies of water. Our bodies are affected by the same gravitational poles as the ocean. We are also affected by the metaphoric gravitational poles of collective events. Last year, we spoke of the waves of the pandemic. Now there are so many factors at play, it's hard to keep track of what wave we are on and if we can even call them waves anymore. Yet a tidal metaphor seems appropriate for how each of us experiences collective events differently. The swell reaches for miles and miles at each location will receive and express its flow differently based on that location's unique factors. It's understandable to not wanna hang out paying attention to your body when there are devastating events unfolding around you. And all too often when we take notice or talk about our bodily experiences, it's in relationship to pain, which is why pain exists to get us to notice particularly if we weren't paying much attention in the first place. When I ask bodywork clients intake questions, I'll ask where they're experiencing pain and they'll tell me an area of their body. Then I ask them if they're going through any life transitions and how they experienced st uh, stress in their bodies. With this answer, a new body story emerges one that usually connects to the most noticeable pain, but contains more nuance and the honest murkiness that comes with being a body. There is so much going on between pain and pleasure and outside of that binary, but we often lack the venue to gift those experiences with our awareness. And that is where dance comes in. The purpose of dance exists outside of pleasure and pain. You know, we certainly hope it's gonna be an, a pleasurable experience and we hope that dance will cure all of our pains. But as anyone who's dedicated to dancing knows, the experience is far more complicated than that. Dance can be difficult, vulnerable, often indulgent and strange, usually all of these things at the same time. 
but because of the murkiness of its purpose, dance is a rich field for phenomenological exploration. And phenomenology is very interested in everything between pleasure and pain. So it's hard to talk about the purpose of dance when there are so many different kinds of dance. So I will speak about my own experience with dance. I practice contemporary dance. Some call it modern dance, but I think about it similarly to how modern art and contemporary art are distinguished from each other. Modern art was a period in the 20th century and contemporary art generally refers to the present era of art. Likewise, modern dance was a period in the 20th century that was followed by postmodern dance and new dance being made now is called contemporary dance. But then it gets complicated because what some people call contemporary dance is actually contemporary ballet, like what you see on TV shows, like So You Think You Can Dance, which is a form of competition dance. The contemporary dance that I'm talking about exists in a lineage, in a lineage of concert dance. It emerged out of classical ballet with dancers who threw off their shoes at the turn of the 20th century. And it would not have developed the way it did with, without Black American culture, indigenous ritual, Buddhist mindfulness, yoga, and the many cultural revolutions of the 20th and 21st centuries. Many of these influences have not been given the credit they are due. So now it's the work of contemporary dancers to excavate the many uh, presences in our practice. Dance as an art form is usually associated with choreographed performance, but an integral part of contemporary dance is improvisation. Much like beat poetry, improvisational dance emerged in mid-century America at the cultural intersection of jazz music and Buddhism. Jazz brought improvisation into public awareness and the introduction of Buddhist teachings in the West brought with it new practices of mindfulness and dance. This is where concert dance branched out into new social dance forms like contact improvisation and five rhythms. The formation of these social dances borrowed both consciously and unconsciously from indigenous and African dance pr principles. Contemporary dance artists often blur the space between concert dance and social dance. We use improvisational scores to explore and experiment with movement concepts, which can also be a research method. When I teach dance, I go back and forth between choreographed movement and improvisation. In phenomenological terms, improvising uses pre-reflective consciousness and choreographing uses reflective consciousness. To explain pre-reflective and reflective, I will first introduce phenomenology. Phenomenology is a method of describing experience or a philosophy of experience. When I introduce phenomenology to people, their reaction is usually along the lines of, that's it? It's a whole philosophy based around describing your experience, but its simplicity reveals how pervasive our assumptions can be. Phenomenology is firsthand experience minus everything we are not experiencing firsthand. We usually use learned facts and others definitions to back up and affirm our experiences, but in doing so, we sometimes miss what we're truly perceiving. And as anyone who has practiced meditation knows, simply being with what is, is extremely challenging. I personally love phenomenology because it gives space and reverence for what exists outside of words while using words to create further intimacy with ineffable experience. This makes it nearly paradoxical, but 
within the joining of words and wordlessness is the alchemical creation of new language and terminology. Edmund Husserl founded phenomenology in effort to bring philosophy back to the things themselves so that experience could provide the foundation of our knowledge. Maurice Merleau-Ponty may be the most beloved phenomenologist by dancers and somatic practitioners because he situates consciousness in the body. For Merleau-Ponty, the body is perception and perception is the body. He also highlights the ambiguity or murkiness of embodied consciousness. I find murkiness to be a very crucial aspect of phenomenology as well as being human. And it's also why I keep using the word murky and murkiness is because is, I find it to be a very, um, something to not be taken for granted within the structure of phenomenology. Murkiness is a understanding that there is no perfect word, symbol or media to translate your firsthand experiences. Reflection will never fully capture pre-reflective consciousness. Gaston Bachelard contributes to phenomenology an answer to the question, is a phenomenology important for more than just the person who creates it? He says yes, because of the affirmation and awe we experience in circles of shared truth. He refers to this in terms of resonance, reverberation, and repercussion. He also recognizes that the profundity of art is because of its resonance. A work of art or a phenomenology that on its surface appears to only be a self-expression can actually create some of the most meaningful connection with others because of its intimacy with experience itself. So now back to pre-reflective and reflective consciousness. I'm sure we all have a understanding of what reflecting is. Reflective consciousness is when you think about an experience after it's happened, or when you take an experience and put it into words. Pre-reflective consciousness is what is happening before you reflect on it. It could be described as being in the present moment or being in your body. Pre-reflective consciousness can be fleeting as we spend most of our time labeling, analyzing, or ignoring our perceptions. Pre-reflection also brings up an association with meditation, which certainly is a form of pre-reflection, but I wanna be clear that pre-reflective consciousness doesn't mean without thought. You can think, move, and sing pre-reflection, but again, it can be fleeting. Once we interpret what we're doing, we're using reflection. Phenomenology is a method of using reflective consciousness to give reverence to pre-reflective experience. Phenomenology seeks to observe our perceptions while disturbing them as little as possible and being honest where our words fall short when faced with the depths of our senses. Reflection and pre-reflection are like tides in our consciousness. The first phase of the tide, you are present with the sensations of your pre-reflective experience. And in the next phase of the tide, you intentionally reflect on that experience, traversing every sensory facet with your reflection. You may find that by moving with the tides of your consciousness, you become even closer to your experience when you reflect on it. Phenomenology takes the rigor to not use the most readily available words and concepts, but to get creative with the words and tools you have to get as close to the bone of the, of the experience as you can. Dance, especially improvisation, is where I practice moving with the tides of pre-reflective and reflective consciousness. I could describe this to you or in half the amount of time we can try it ourselves. So we're gonna do a little hand dance. You can 
do it with your camera off. You can do it with your camera on, um, however you would like to participate. Uh, the task is that we're just gonna move our hands, one hand or two hands, and try to move them without planning what they're going to do. Try not to interpret or analyze what's happening while you're doing it, but also don't hold back any spontaneous impressions that come to you. So we're just gonna take a little moment now. And just notice whether you're choosing to watch your hands, the video of your hands, or the other people's hands. And trying as much as you can to just stay with the experience as it's unfolding. You can let that come to a rest. Now, take a moment to reflect on what that experience was like, both the movement of your hands and anything else you were experiencing simultaneously. And if you'd like to share a word or phrase in the chat, you may do so. I was going all out with my hands, so they're a little sore now, but. <laughs> I found that I was, uh, thoughts were coming into my head almost with every movement as I was watching my hand, as associating it with something I've seen or how it looks. And uh, I wasn't just able to be with it without thoughts like one tries during meditation. So yeah. thoughts keep coming to me. Also, it was an interesting experience. I've never done that. Where I look at my hands consciously <laughs> in different motion. <laughs> Thank you, Stella. Yeah, um, that that highlights that it's really hard to divide the space between pre-reflective and reflective because of the way that our minds work, and that um, pre-reflective doesn't necessarily mean that you're not thinking at all, but that you're trying to um, withhold overly analyzing what's happening, and so thoughts can come up but that those thoughts themselves are also a part of the pre-reflection. Um, but I find that dance, I can, I can allow myself to distract myself the most with my body <laughs> moving to let, allow my mind to kind of stop analyzing as much. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> it's like doing any creative work where you, for you, I guess, what dance feels like. I've experienced it in other forms where mm. you sense of time and you feel like you know, I, I described it, I used to walking with the gods. Mm. You know, just, there's no beginning or ending, you're just lost in it in whatever you're doing. But that happens when you're passionate about something. Mm. And um, something that you practice and acquire. Yeah, thank you. And thank you for your, uh, everyone else for their words in the chat. Layla, did you wanna share? Um, yeah, hi. Um, it was just funny to me that we did, you said to do this exercise cause this, I didn't realize this was a somatic exercise but this was something that I started doing like in the past year out of nowhere. Um, I would, I live in Monterey and I would drive over to Santa Cruz and, and just like go, you know, hiking and stuff in the forest there. And I would find myself, especially when I'm listening to music, I, especially when I get restless, my hands just started moving like that. And so I just started really playing with it. And I would just be sitting in the car and there was people looking, walking by, kind of looking at me. And I'm just like sitting there, like doing all these weird things, but it felt so calming for me. And then I started remembering that when I was younger, I mean, anytime I would hear music, I would automatically start following the the melody and the rhythm and everything with with my hands. 
I didn't really know why, but it just it helped doing that. I started remembering a lot of things from when I was little. Um, so I don't know, just doing this exercise right now, it just, it felt kind of special. So thank you. <laughs> thank you for sharing. Yeah, I find that a hand dance is one of the most simple improvisations that we can engage in. And so it's a really fun tool to have in your toolbox. You need a little movement. All right. Um, in the book, How to Land by Ann Cooper Albright, she invites us to use our bodies and dance um, to explore the dynamic challenges we face collectively. Learning to dance with physically falling can help us face other instabilities. This, this approach inspired me to explore fluidity and tides through dance to help us stay present with ourselves through constant change. So both falling and tides are a result of gravity. Cooper Albright writes, quote, gravity, both the physical experience of one's weight because of the earth's pull and the more metaphorical implications of being grounded in the midst of ongoing turmoil in the world around us can provide an important balance to the social, political, and economic unpredictability that surrounds us these days. Gravity is related to a sense of profundity, rootedness, and an inherent connection to the earth, as well as falling, disability, and even death. While we may understand gravity as a concept, we are often not particularly aware of gravity as a physical sensation. In my college dance classes and the professional workshops that I teach internationally, I've witnessed how a renewed attention to feeling the support of the earth can transform moments of personal disorientation and national crisis into an opportunity to reflect on the critical relationship between individual resiliency and communal responsibility." End quote. So How to Land was published in 2019 with an uncanny prescience for what would become even more relevant the following year. And uh, I also wanted to add in that those of us who are archetypal astrology folks, um, gravity is also very Saturnian and all the things that she was naming is very related to Saturn. This, um, this book, How to Land, was being passed around by my dancer friends last year when my friend Cecilia gave it to me and I started to read it it inspired me to plan dance classes. Concepts and exercises I've been thinking about for over a decade started coming together. We couldn't yet dance in the studio together, so I gathered the tools we would need when we finally could. I asked myself, what kind of movement do we need to take care of ourselves and each other? to process this collective experience and to get to the heart of why we love to dance? How do we choose to return to dance, return to our bodies, to return to our connections with each other? How do we make returning supportive and accessible? So first, to emerge out of stagnation and isolation, I'd like to invite you into a, um, a practice that I do to open every dance class. You can, everyone's welcome to observe if you would rather observe, but I, you're also welcome to stand up and try this yourself as well. And again, you can have your camera on, you can have your camera off. It is totally up to you. We are going to practice a kind of reverberation like Bachelard's metaphor of shared truth, but also a literal reverberation. We are going to shake. Shaking tends to and replenishes the fluids in your body. Your lymph requires physical movement and shaking in order for it to be restored, to help us um, heal, to help us bring down swelling. Our um, joints need movement to produce synovial fluid. Um, uh, this kind of shaking and movement uh, creates uh, 
it brings your heart rate up. And so that increases blood flow as well. In this, you have to let go of what you look like. You sense gravity and you receive the rebounding energy from the earth and you receive the resonance of those around you. It also resembles a type of movement that most of us have a relationship to, which is how we dance like in a dance party when you're just bobbing around and shaking and dancing and moving. So on that note, I'm gonna get up. You can get out of your camera view. You can do whatever you want. You can watch me be weird and move around, but I'm just gonna start shaking. I'm letting my weight drop down, trying to be loose and floppy. Right now I'm just bouncing up and down as if I were on a trampoline. And I'm thinking about letting everything go. I'm allowing my feet to open up and be spongy into the ground so that I can receive energy back up from the earth. And we're just gonna pretend that we have a really great song playing. And so we're just bobbing and dancing the way that you would if there was a really great beat happening. But then you can also get shakier and vibrational and we get a little weirder <laughs> and get into the, the nooks and crannies, the places that are hard to get to. You can try relaxing your face. <sighs> letting go of anything you don't need, any ongoing tension. We're just gonna continue for a little bit longer. It's good to do this just a little bit longer than you, you feel like you want to, because then you get start to become really receptive. Da, 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 da. And, I'll just let us bounce. I'll stop talking. <laughs> just shaking. I'll just count down. Shake it out for 10. Shaking as much as you can. Nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one, and let it go. <sighs> and you can come back. Now I wonder if you feel more connected to your breath now. Take a moment to breathe. Enjoy the sensation of breathing. So when I, when me and my other dancers and my dance company came back into the studio, the main thing that I wanted for all of us was for everything to be simpler. Simpler and more specific to our very basic needs to really rise to what is needed in this time, which is on a very basic level, connecting to your breath and connecting to your body, really. I'm gonna go right into introducing another simple tool, which is to allow yourself to take up space and to allow yourself to contract. This can be done while still sitting, or you can get up again, you can watch me again, choose your own adventure. It's based around the breath and using the breath as an anchor to your bodily experience. Breath is the body's tide that connects the exterior world to the interior. And as you breathe in, you're letting the outside world come into you. As you breathe out, you're giving a little bit of yourself to the outside world. So this is called core distal. And I use it when I feel pulled in multiple directions at once. This exercise can help me um, connect 
to fully expanding and fully contracting. You embody the cycle of your breath, bringing what is always happening in the background of your experience to the foreground. The more you let yourself contract, the readier you will be to expand. This comes from developmental movement. And so it's one of the first movements that we learn how to do when we're babies. So it's also a, a movement pattern that can be very soothing for your baby self. Um, so as you breathe in, you want to reach all your limbs out to the farthest distal edges. Your distal is what's, what that means the farthest you can reach away from the center of your body, that's distal. So you reach out your arms and legs to your distal edges when you breathe in. And when you breathe out, you curl up. I'm gonna climb on top of my chair so you can see me. <laughs> when you breathe out, you curl up into a little ball. You can almost see me. <laughs> you curl up into a little ball. And so this exercise I find useful for the feelings of being pulled in multiple directions at once when you're being asked to do more than you want to do when you're really just wanting to contract and when you are wanting to be out in the world in a way that you can't be right now. This is a way to remind yourself with your breath that with when you contract fully, you know there will be expansion again. And when you expand fully, you know that you'll be able to contract again. And so if you haven't yet, you might wanna try out this movement. Just We're gonna do it just a few times to connect with your breath, breathing in. When you expand fully, breathing out as you contract fully into your core. can also be a nice thing to do first thing in the morning. And I wonder if you maybe notice which direction feels more enjoyable for you right now. I can kind of, the time of year kind of, you can guess where a lot of us probably wanna be. Right. So I wanna to speak to another tide that exists in the body. And that is the, the craniosacral tide or the tide of cerebral spinal fluid. So this is a much subtler tide in the body. The fluid of this tide is the cerebral spinal fluid or CSF. The flow of this tide is what we work with as craniosacral therapists. This is a quote from Bonnie Baybridge Cohen, who created Body Mind Centering. Quote, the cerebral spinal fluid, CSF, is the fluid of the nervous system. It flows from the center of the body, the central nervous system, to the periphery, all cells. Produced in the ventricles of the brain, it moves down along the spinal cord and continues out the cranial and spinal nerves into the tub tubules of fascia where it empties into the intercellular flu fluid of the connective tissues and then into all the cells of the body. From the cells, it is cycled back to the heart through the veins and lymphatic vessels. The CSF is clear and very slow moving. Its movement is powered by the craniosacral coccygeal pump movement between the skull and the tail. It has its own rhythmic cycle called the CSF ryth rhythm or CSFR, which is different than the blood pulse and respiratory rhythms. Like the blood pulse, the CSFR can be felt in all parts of the body. It is subtle yet perceivable, cyclic movement between the filling phase when the CSF is being produced 
and the emptying phase when the CSF is being absorbed. During the filling phase, all the bones of the body minimally but, percept but perceivably flex, abduct and or externally rotate. During the emptying phase, the bones minimally extend, adduct and or internally rotate. So to explore the craniosacral tide or CSF rhythm, let us first open up the base of our skulls. When we are overly tight in this area or spend too much time out of alignment, it can restrict the flow of cerebral spinal fluid. There is a joint between the occiput, the base of the skull. So this is, this is your occiput um, and the sphenoid which is a butterfly shaped bone in the inside of your skull directly behind the eyes. If you haven't seen the sphenoid before, go look it up, it's really cool. Um, and they form a kind of joint like this, inside of the skull, base of the skull. And the cerebral spinal fluid flows through and creates this little flapping motion of the butterfly in your skull as the cerebral spinal fluid flows through it. So, and because of the skull is so, is wrapped in such tight fascia that just that the flow of that fluid through there affects the, 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 the way that the fascia is connected throughout the entire body. And so I think that's, that's one of the reasons you can feel this tide anywhere in the body because it creates this really subtle rippling. Um, so first, Let's, to connect to our sphenoid bone, I wanna have us relax our eyes because we've been staring at a screen for a while. So rub your hands together, produce some warmth. And now place your hands over your eyes and allow yourself to give your eyes some nice energy. Allow your eyes to relax back into your skull. Now you can slowly remove your hands and drift your eyes open, trying to keep them still sitting back and relaxed in your skull. Now we're going to do what's called Yes, No, Maybe from Ann Cooper Albright. And we're going to just nod our heads, yes, really small, and try to make it even smaller so you can barely see it from the outside. Thinking about the joint of the occiput on the top of the spine and see if that tiny motion can help release the muscles of the neck. And if you're sitting upright, see if, it can, if you can feel your sacrum getting heavier as you do this motion. Now, rotate your head as if you were saying no. And again, make that a very small motion. And let that motion invite your muscles of your neck and shoulders to relax, your sacrum to get heavier. And now move your head side to side as if you were saying maybe. And see if you can let that help relax muscles a little bit too. And open up the availability of the base of the skull. And now just one, one more little movement. Just imagine that your head is a bobble head and just move it around in all in all directions, really small. It's almost imperceptible, just feeling the head resting on the top of the spine. All right, nice. And now to explore the movement of the cerebral spinal fluid tide, um, when we explore the movement that it makes by just doing it, it can help us connect to that presence in our bodies. So first let's just try another subtle movement of I'm bringing my head, I'm 
I'm indicating with my hand, but my head and my tail are gonna come close to each other and farther away. Probably can't see me very well, but what I'm doing is I'm going like I'm curving and then I'm arching, curving and arching. So exploring, just curving and arching your spine. And then make it really slow. So head and tail both rock to the back, head and tail both rock forward towards each other. And now we're going to try rotating our arms and legs. You can relax, relax your arms and legs. And if you're in a position that allows for it, try rotating. I'm just gonna show you, try to show my arms, limited screen. Um, I'm going to, this is external rotation and this is internal rotation. So if you are relaxed, if your limbs are relaxed, just try externally rotating and internally rotating your arms and your legs. And so now we're gonna put these two movements together, the spine and the arms and legs, but why I did them separately first, because it's kind of counterintuitive. When the cerebral spinal fluid is filling, our, our, our spine goes into flexion. So that's going forward while our arms and legs go externally rotate. So we externally rotate while the head and tail come towards each other to the front. And then go the opposite direction, internally rotate the arms and legs while the head and tail go to the back. And we're gonna do that really slowly now, just following maybe two cycles of breath in each direction. So right now we're uh, externally rotating arms and legs, head and tail to the front. Now head and tail move towards the back as you internally rotate arms and legs. And one more time, real slowly, externally rotating the arms and legs as your head and tail come forward. Now internally rotating your arms and legs as your head and tail go back. So that was an exploration of the short tide. There's also a fun lore in craniosacral therapy and I call it lore because it's just like this little thing that my craniosac craniosacral teacher just um, happened to say at some point that um, has like, it haunts me to this day that there's something called the long tide that takes a much longer time to move through the body that is also connected to the cerebral spinal fluid but also has some a level of mysteriousness to it because supposedly the long tide, if you were to feel it on one person and feel it on someone else in a different room or in a different country, they would, their long tide would be moving exactly the same way. So that's the lore about the long tide is that we have also this tide that moves through us and all living things that is flowing in the same way and that we, our hands can get sensitive enough to feel it. But it's a little bit in the lore. I just wanted to share it because it has to do with tides and I love it. All right. So just take a sip of water. All of this has a lot to do with connective tissue. Um, the rippling that, that we experience throughout the body of when the, uh, when the craniosacral tide is happening is because it's moving through the fascia and the connective tissue as well. Fascia is a type of connective tissue, just I might use them interchangeably. My interest in connective tissue in the context of this talk is because of its fluidity and the way that is always subtly expressing the, the tides in our body. Connective tissue is also a powerful metaphor for how we are impacted by the world and those around us 
and how in turn we impact our surroundings. In one of Merleau-Ponty's later theories, he talks about flesh as what connects us with others and the world. My interpretation of his concept of flesh may take some creative liberties, but I would be one of many who have seen the potential to translate flesh into connective tissue. Connective tissue has the possibility of being an extension of our bodies through our senses. So I have this type of meditation that I've done um, where I imagine that everything that I can sense, including everything I can see, everything that I'm hearing, is somehow an extension of my body because I am sensing it. And I then think about my physical body as the anchor of my experience and then my breath as the deeper anchor within my bodily experience. Um, I find it as a, a very interesting way to illustrate the gravitational pulls that the world has around you. When I have the, do this meditation, I instead of just hearing with my ears, I try to sense with my body where I'm feeling that sound. And with my sight, really seeing it as the sphere that I'm contained within. And when I can see for a very long ways, like all the way to a horizon, um, I allow myself to feel the vastness that I can contain. So this is real, I think it's a great exercise, um, but it also, when it comes to being with other people doing an exercise like this and with Merleau-Ponty's concept of flesh, um, there's potentially problematic nature of extending your self, sense of self into other people's spaces. Um, so I wanna speak to the other side of this poll uh, with a quote from Ann Cooper Albright. She says, quote, Merleau-Ponty claims that the experience of his body serves to open it up to knowing other bodies. I can feel myself touched as well as at the same time as touching. This connectedness of his body to other bodies, he attributes to our intercorporeal being, part of what he calls the thickness of flesh, that tangible ground of connective tissue, which allows us to sense another body to body. Merleau-Ponty's conceptualization of flesh as a condition of our humanity has been vociferously critiqued by feminist philosophers, including Simone de Beauvoir and Luce Irigueri, among others. While acknowledging Merleau-Ponty's important contributions to discussions of embodiment as the ground for our being in the world, these scholars are understandably resistant to what they perceive as a re reassertion of a masculinist universalized self in the midst of an erasure of categories of difference, including those of gender, race, class, ability, and sexuality. So both Cooper Albright and dancer philosopher Susan Kozel see a way to make Merleau-Ponty's concept of flesh less problematic and less universalized when you, when you bring in the metaphor, metaphor of connective tissue. So Susan Kozel says in her book, Closer, quote, human connective tissue, also called fascia or the fascial web, so permeates the body as to be a part of the immediate environment of every cell. Without its support, the brain would be runny custard. The liver was spread through the abdominal cavity and we would end up as a puddle at our own feet. Significant to our consideration of human networks or communication channels between people is that in addition to keeping everything connective, connected, connective tissue creates separation within our bodies. It creates space for nerves, blood vessels, and fluids to pass. This is a reminder that networks are not just ways for us to maintain connection, Networks are ways for us to maintain distance or difference. So I love a good paradox and connective tissue definitely has that. It is interstitial space, the division and the space between things. It also holds, interconnects, delivers messages and circulates. 
connective tissue is also embodied memory. It is where the fluid stream of time and events makes its corporeal marks on the body because fascia holds patterns. Whatever movements we do day in and day out, wherever we are sitting too long or doing the same repetitive task, our fascia remembers that, as well as the places where we feel stress and tension, where we protect ourselves, places that we're hypermobile or have trauma, those will all have effect, effect on the entire fascial web. So when you do this exercise where you imagine that your seaweed suspended in water, but still rooted to gravity, you have the ability to drift into finding your connective tissues patterning. And when you follow those patterns, your body starts to unwind. So really pretending that you're floating in water can help awaken this internal fluidity. So something to keep in mind about fascia is that it's chaotically patterned. That is how it can be the most resilient and responsive by patterning and interweaving in as many directions as possible. When it's viewed on a microscopic level, it looks like a fluid multi-directional spider web that changes its shape in response to motion. So when you move at the level of fascia, it has the multi-directional quality of floating in water. So I'm gonna show you two different ways of, of holding your arms. I can hold my arms fully up. This is an fully engaged, I can be fully released. That's, I'm just, my arms are completely relaxed by my sides. And now I'm going to try to find a space in between those two things. So really I've tried many ways of describing this exercise, but honestly pretending that your seaweed is the, mo is the best way <laughs> to describe it. Our, our body, responds to imagery really well, almost more than trying to direct it to do a very specific thing. So we're going to look for this place where I am not super engaged in trying to make any particular movement happen. And I'm also not just releasing fully I'm allowing myself to play and get curious in this floating in water state. And your arms can be a part of this. Your spine and head can be a part of this. And what I'm particularly trying to do is I'm trying to not make anything happen, but also not stop anything from happening, finding the space in between. I recommend spending a good amount of time with this, just revisiting it every once in a while. Moving like seaweed with the fluidity of tides and doing this, the body starts to tell its own story. Because when you float along, eventually you might find a place that feels more tense, but you don't feel like you're actually making that tension happen. So you can kind of go with it, like when you're swimming and get caught in a rip current and you go with the current in order to get out of it. So if you're, I'm like, right now I'm twisting off in this place, I'm like getting into a bit of a crunchy, tense place, but I'm just gonna keep following this flow that I'm feeling happening until eventually it dissipates. And this is something we call unwinding in craniosacral therapy. So if you're doing this practice, you can keep doing it if you want to, or you can let it go. Um, I might just float like seaweed at random times. It's just always a great thing to do. Um, this was inspired by 
the kind of winding unwinding we do in craniosacral therapy usually um, the client is fully released and you're holding uh, a limb and letting and finding it unwinding it was it was a bit of a surprise to me when i found that i could experience unwinding moving myself and then I brought it together with an exercise um, developed by Steve Paxton, who is one of the founders of Contact Improvisation, what he calls the small dance, which is where you just stand and um, move without, um, without trying to make anything happen, but you're just listening to the movements that are happening even when you're not trying to make anything happen. So we are always moving, we're breathing, the shifting of weight happens. Um, real subtle shifts and whatnot. And so this is taking that. And then also the exploration that comes into the unwinding that comes from uh, one of my teachers, Barbara Dilly, who is also a pioneer of improvisational dance, uh, what she calls kinesthetic delight. That is a part of it, that there's something important about the fact that this is a dance and that it's not a body therapy that you're doing for yourself that allows your your ability to be playful and to stumble into things that might actually be meaningful or helpful but i think that there's our um, connecting with the fascial body can often be a bit tricky and when you look too hard for it it won't it'll be it'll kind of dis disappear into the interstitial spaces so this dance, I'm really into this dance. I call this dance the Swells Dance. And it is, um, it brings together a lot of the things that I've been talking about, about today. Our body's fluids, our internal tides. It requires pre-reflective consciousness because you're trying not to plan what's happening. It brings in the playful curiosity of dance. And then it also highlights pathways in the body that are unique only to you. So every person will do this dance completely differently depending on how their bodies are patterned. As I mentioned previously, I start every class with shaking. And then after shaking, I do lead directly into this swells dance. And so when you've done a big movement and you stop it, it's a very easy to feel the resonance of the movement left over. And also it creates a container for dance class that invites more to be present than just the practice of dancing. The final piece I'd like to bring in is the concept of return. That is the promise that tides always have. Tides have the promise of return. About a decade ago, I taught a class called Dancing Cycles of Return. It's, it was inspired by the fact that it's easy to fall out of the practice of dancing with others, but much harder to return to your practice of dancing. I was fascinating with returning, I was fascinated with returning to dance as something that is an inevitable part of being a dancer which in turn means that time spent not dancing is also essential to being a dancer. Now in the context of the pandemic, cycles of return has taken on a new meaning. All of us have things that we have either recently returned to that we haven't done in a while, or we have things and people that we have not returned to yet. And now and for a while from now, I think the, the concept of return is going to be um, is going to be very relevant. And I just thought like, what if there's nowhere to return to? Well, I think that there's this, that there will always be a cyclical nature. I think that like a spiral, you know, um, I think tides are more like a spiral than they are like a circle. They're never going to return to exactly the same place. The landscape itself is changed by the time the tide comes back in. And so even if something isn't the same or will never be recognizable to what it was before, this, the motion of the return is still there.
So I think of connecting of, with tides as different kinds of meditations on returning that leads us back to ourselves, leads us back to a sense of home, and hopefully leads us back to a place that feels safe. I wanna review the practices we did so that you can keep them as tools to return to your body and to return to yourself. We did a hand dance, which is a simple improvisation to connect to pre-reflective consciousness. We did shaking to replenish our fluids. We did core distal to expand fully and to contract fully, as well as anchoring yourself within your breath. And we explored the flexion and extension and the rotations of the craniosacral tides, rotating slowly to connect with the cerebral spinal fluid. Also the head and eyes release is a really nice one for computer time. And then of course the swells dance, moving like seaweed con to connect to your fascial web, your internal sea and your capacity for buoyancy. I hope that these practices create some resonance in you as you navigate the tides within and without you. Thank you. Thank you. So much, Celine. Thank you, that was so amazing. Thanks. Thank you, Soleil. <laughs> um, and now is the fun part where people get to say anything or make comments or ask questions or conversation. So whoever feels called to uh, say anything, please do so. Well, if I may, I'm, <clears throat> I'm, I jumped in last time too, but I, I do have to go soon. But Soleil, what? Uh, delight that was it's so good to see you again and um um my god i can see how you've just continued to deepen and um exfoliate uh, the uh all, all of the dimensions that i knew you had before and that you had shared with us before but it's so impressive to see where you are and um yeah that was such a such a um an inspiring <clears throat> transdisciplinary embodied participatory offering that uh you know that connects philosophical themes that that are dear to you and that, that figure in our program as well <clears throat> with um our current moment but in an embodied way anyway just deep bow to you I, it was such a delight <clears throat> and um last thing i'll say is um well, I wish we had some some shared space to to share notes because since we we saw each other in the flesh world last time, <clears throat> I've um, been really deepening into my own practice, particularly the uh, each one or da chong da chuan practice, <clears throat> which um, involves a uh, uh, there's a standing practice, standing meditation, but then going from there. And, and initiating really, really very, very small movements and uh, letting them uh, spontaneously sort of exfoliate into uh, what's called the health dance, or jen wu, which is individual for each person. <clears throat> and uh, the neat thing about it is that um, uh, uh, having spent, you know, years and years learning <clears throat> these forms, so very sort of reflective, um, internalization of form which can be practiced as a form in a pre-reflective way where the form just does itself but then in this particular practice the the, the the form has gone completely and yet continues to inform this spontaneous manifestation of movement mm -hmm. so sorry this is so long but i hope at some point i get to show you this and um, compare notes with you so if I do, yeah <laughs> if i do if I do leave soon, please forgive me, but so great to see you. Thank you so much, Sean. Good to see you too. <laughs> mm.
Yeah, I'm fascinated by all the um, other very fluid uh, movement forms that are out there. I mean, there's so I could, could just go on and on, but I am not an expert in all the other practices that are there. I know there's a lot out there. Um, I'm actually going to be taking an embodiment workshop uh, in December with, I don't know if you're familiar with her or not, Dr. S. Amma Ray. Mm -hmm. um, it's going to be in Carmel. And she created a program called Embodiology Immersion. And um, she takes from her African roots and, and the practices of her people and how they use dance um, and connect it with, you know, that connection with the self and with the land and with, with everything. So I'm very excited for that. And um, I'm actually in PCC right now, but I'm in the process of applying for the somatic psychology program. So this was just, I just saw this event. Um, I got the email earlier today and I was just like, oh my God, this is insane. <laughs> So thank you so much. This, these practices, so much started coming up and I was like writing as I was doing the practices. And um, this was just like a really nice, like foreshadow for what I'll be, I'll be doing and hopefully what I'll be doing with clients I'll be working with. So thank you. This was really, really great. Awesome. Thank you. What a, yeah, what a great bridge between the two programs. My, my partner actually went through the somatic psychology program at CIS. And so are very connected. <laughs> um, so Lei, thank you for this. Um, in all these different ways, I think the whole thing was like brilliant through and through um and the way and the connections that you're making between our internal and external ecologies and um i there's a lot that i could say i think that one of the things that st struck me the most and i guess it's a question that i have around um the the tidal relationship with the fascia because i I've, I've found the like coming into an understanding of fascia, like in my own subtle body and in my own pain body. And I found it to be really freeing in a lot of ways because I tend to be very like dense and intense. And the idea that actually all of that density is like this matrix that is like sort of flexible in all of these ways. And yes, it like pinpoints around certain trauma points or around sort of different, um, parts of our bodily history, but then also it has this um, innate flexibility and fluidity and sort of permeability and, and spaciousness. And so that's been really kind of um, helpful for me. Um, and then you're talking about the, the tides of it. And so I'm wondering, and I, I apologize if I missed it, if you said it already, but I'm wondering um, the, the timing of the, of the tidal inflow and outflow of the, of the um, fluid from, am I right that it goes from the heart out through the fascia and back to the heart, or does it start somewhere else and then end up at the heart? It starts up here. Mm -hmm. It starts in the brain. Behind the eyes and and all that with the it's actually it's developed in the ventricles of the brain itself. Um, so my my question, I guess, is both um, how long does that process generally take, and then also, um, you know, um, I tend to I think all of us have um, relationships, let's say, astrologically with the moon and with our own sort of moon cycles, what, regardless of our gender, but also very much in, in, in touch with our gender. Um, and so um, I'm wondering the connection that you might make between that, um, that internal fascia fluid tide, and then like something like the mood scape of the month or the, the sort of fullness or like, whatever the different sort of ebbs and flows of the lunar cycle and how those relate to each other. Mm, 
That's a, that's an awesome, awesome question. Um, so the, to answer your first part, uh, the, the craniosacral rhythm uh, or tides, it's sometimes called the rhythm or the tide. Um, it, I was looking in all my books for the exact amount of seconds it takes, but it takes, um, I believe it's a 16 second cycle. So it's eight seconds of filling, eight seconds of emptying. And so eight seconds where the um, cerebral spinal fluid is being produced and flowing down through the, the spinal column and out through the fascia and nerves and being distributed into the blood system and then coming back to the heart when it's emptying. And so it's, it's the process that, I guess, I don't know, it's part of the fluid system. And um, the, so yeah. Keep it uh, looking when if you're physically looking for the sensation of those tides is it is usually around eight seconds in one direction, eight seconds in the other direction. Uh, and then with the lunar cycles, well, the the moon. I I mean I think on a in a gravitational way, I think about how when like the moon is rising when it's like high tide, the the moon is pulling towards it. And so it's going to heighten the, um, the, the sensation of filling, or maybe perhaps even when the moon is full, maybe there'll be more of a, um, a pulling towards the filling part of the tides. And then when the moon is either um, at, or when the tides are at low tide, or when it's during the, moon, uh, the new moon, um, perhaps there's more of a emphasis on the emptying, but I, that's, as, that's my speculation about how it connects. Um, yeah, I think it's probably pretty experiential for each person, but I would love to do a bunch of craniosacral sessions on people and keep track of the lunar phases and, um, notice how I sense the tides differently. <laughs> There. Yeah, thank you for your comments, Sarah. And I wonder about DMT. Well, I do have an interesting thought about the um, relationship between DMT and um, being able to sense the movement of the fascia. Um, I don't, I can't speak to actually like taking DMT, but um, I know that DMT is released when we're dreaming. And so, and so I, this might be too adjacent, but, um, I've noticed that, uh, when I'm working with craniosacral clients and I, I can tell immediately if I have my hands on them, I can tell immediately if they've fallen asleep because all of a sudden I can feel, uh, the movement of their, um, tides so much clearer that I, I've always contrib uh, attributed that to the way that the mind likes to get in the way of the movements and like the story that the body's fascia is telling or um, what the fluids are doing on their own before the mind is kind of like clamping things down. And so as soon as the mind releases into sleep, it becomes so much more available to express itself and unwind without the mind inserting itself. Yeah, thank you for that response. Um, I know I made a few comments in there relative to working with um, fungi or plant medicine or, or even the correlation perhaps between the fascia and mycelium networking. Mm -hmm. um, and one of the experiences that I have had and with dance especially, but with working with certain medicines, specifically with DMT, is that feeling of... Um, kind of that feeling of that in-between space that that once at least sensed to be void for myself, even if there was something there, maybe maybe the fascia or something else, there is this kind of re-enchantment of that space that takes place. And because of that, it allows for more plasticity and flow and movement within that space and also um, within transpersonal spaces that I find exist within the body as well. Mm. 
Yeah, thank you for that. That that reminds me of, um, I think that the word that I didn't bring in when it comes to the metaphor of connective tissue um, is transpersonal. Um, and that I think there is something very much there, like when you go into like a more spiritual connection to fascia, that there, I think that there is something to the idea of it extending beyond ourselves and being in, interconnecting us um, similar to mycelium. Uh, yeah. Um, I was, thank you so much, so like this, um, I feel like every, every time we do a new forum, like it's always my favorite, so thank you. Um, and yeah, I was really interested in, in, you mentioned, you know, this idea that you go with the current to get out of it, um, and you sort of go with the flow and dissipate until it dissipates. Um, and I've been sort of surfing and, and boogie boarding recently. And, you know, when you're sort of on a board, you, you very much feel like that seaweed and then it's been transferring into my dreams. And, um, and like when I close my eyes, you know, the, the sort of, um, waves, et cetera. Um, so yeah, I was, I was curious about, you know, you mentioned the mind kind of getting in the way. Um, but then potentially like being in the waves kind of, you know, rewriting you uh, in a way that kind of gets, um, gets past that barrier maybe. Um, and I guess as it sort of goes out of you, you know, and that resonance, that sort of your contribution to the dance floor, so to speak. Mm. Um, and, you know, there was that, um, story about how at a concert, right, you have this sort of surge and, and people can die from that. Um, and so to continue the kind of scaling up and, and at the sort of macro levels, I guess I'm wondering if you, you know, there's so many different surges, so to speak, and there's so many different currents and whether it's archetypal or political or, or economic, et cetera, um, it seems like, you know, and I think you started, started this conversation with we're kind of on always being bombarded with all of this sort of sensory information. So I wonder, you know, in terms of like dream, like an awakened dream in which we are sort of more in the flow with you know, the waves and the sort of natural rhythms as they're moving through us, um, where you see kind of at those macro level, um, bigger scales than just your own body. Um, do you see that in, where you see that in either popular culture or, or subcultures or, you know, mass culture or, um, and, yeah, what what currents are you are you wanting to dance with maybe? Hmm. Hmm. Wow. I I mean that's <laughs> that's like a very expansive question. And um I think that I mean there's so much. I'm I feel my my main inspiration is um is around art and um and various dance forms and i think that um i uh contemporary dance is a relatively underappreciated art form and i think that there are things happening in it that are really uh exciting and um uh, that demonstrate so many things that I hope for society to be embodying. And so I, I see dance artists um, using these concepts and moving with their bodies in ways that I hope that we could just be living in the world. Um, but I'm, I'm sure that there's like other 
examples on a, even larger scales, but I don't, I wouldn't know how to answer right. that. Yeah. Can you, can you give an example maybe of like one, one of those artists or one of those kind of dynamics that you're seeing? Yeah. Um, hmm. <laughs> you on the spot, <laughs> I, I guess, yeah, because I'm just wondering sort of how it moves from the individual into the mm. collective maybe. Um, yeah. And, um, and how you might see it in, in that dance. Or other people, if they want to take it and how they see it in their lives too. Well, I, I mean, I feel like I have to go just like one step at a time, but like going from the individual to then like the collective of like literally the dance collective that I'm a part of and how we use these techniques and how I see it impact us and how we relate to each other that, um, we, we move like this, but it isn't a, um, it isn't entirely unrelated that we are, our organizational structure is fully a collective and we don't have, we're leaderless and we're able to um, make decisions as a whole. And we are, we're a nonprofit and we um, are constantly engaged with how we can become more ethical and equitable and um, serve our community better. And I think that these dance practices and these, these movements, this uh, being responsive to the swells and the tides is also a way to participate in community. And I think that um, there is, like I said, like the literal and metaphoric happening simultaneously that you do this, you're, we're doing these dances and we're also participating in that kind of way. Um, I don't know how, I mean, like to, if I don't forget get practical about it, it feels like kind of a little bit of a, uh, maybe an easy answer to say like, oh, you could take these techniques and bring it into other businesses or other people, organizational structures. And we can use these somatic techniques to um, get out of our heads and to recognize that a lot of the um, structures that work well already exist in nature and nature already exists in our bodies and so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. Well, so like if, um, if anybody wants to share any last things, please go ahead and, and put it in the um, chat and we can um, share that. Uh, Irene says you're a genius, uh, <laughs> and I highly agree. Um, but Soleil, maybe maybe while people are sort of putting any last thoughts in, you can um, share maybe one one last thought um, as we sort of go out and, and do our own movement. And um, yeah, anything you'd like to leave us with? Yeah, I mean, um, I think that like you said, that it's it's nice to have an example of um, what what is happening in contemporary dance that I'm actually talking about. And so I encourage those of you who are not um, familiar with um, uh, contemporary dance to see the as live performance starts happening again, to go see performances and to go into some of that unfamiliar territory. And then also um, remembering these um, that these very simple practices um, can be incredible tools to uh, return to our bodies. And um, yeah, I wonder if there's anything else. And then also like for folks on, on the on the dance side, I just I feel so um, privileged to be able to uh, be given a platform to speak as a dancer. Um, we dance, you don't often, often hear from dancers. And I think that um, I'm really inspired by the potential of, of speaking more about our body practices. Thank you. Um, Nicholas reminds us that the um, lunar eclipse, I think is gonna be at its peak at 1.03 a.m. Uh, I think it begins at 9 p.m. So you got a, you got a little bit to, uh, to enjoy that and get ready for that. But thank you again, um, Soleil, and I'm gonna um, welcome you to stay after the recording if you'd like or, or sign off and uh, do as you see. But thank you again and thank you all for being here.